Okay, so um, thank you very much for, for giving me the opportunity to present my work. And I also would like to take uh, the opportunity to thank the organizers of this uh, very nice uh, seminar series that I am really, really enjoying uh, because uh, um, uh, during this time where everything is cancelled and we, are, we cannot go to the office, I think it's very important to keep our community closed and uh, uh, to share research. So thank you. Um, so uh, this, uh, uh, the work I'm going to present is a revision of my job market paper, uh, where I also changed the title. It was Crash Risk in Individual Stocks, and now I changed into Skewness Stocks on Individual Stocks to be more, more specific on, uh, on what I do. So um, uh, my paper um, contributes to the literature that studies uh, the uh, premium uh, linked to the higher moments of the return distribution. So we know that, that there is a positive equity premium, which is modeled into the CAPM framework and factor models. Uh, we also know uh, more recently that there is a negative variance risk premium. So investors don't like variance. And uh, here I can see two main uh, uh, empirical methodology that uh, showed evidence of this uh, negative variance risk premium. So the first methodology is the methodology that uh, studies the risk neutral variance and compare to the realized variance. And this is the methodology, for example, this, the variance swap of Karen Wu or also the methodology of Boller's lab or or Martin. And what, the, what this literature finds uh, is that uh, the risk neutral uh, variance is higher than the realized variance. So the, the variance risk premium, which is P variance minus Q variance, is negative. The other methodology is uh, uh, the methodology of Ang and co-authors, so where they look at the cross section of stocks. And they look at the sensitivity of the cross section of stocks to the market variance. And what they find is that uh, the stocks that are more sensitive to the market variance, they have a lower return afterwards. And this also points to the negative variance risk premium because these stocks are the stocks that do well when the variance is high. So they are edge. So these two methodologies are consistent to each other. And there is a negative variance risk premium when investors don't like variance. So then what about skewness? And here is where my paper fits. Well, here, the two methodologies uh, are not consistent to each other, so they give a different contradictory results. So the first methodology that studies directly the Q skewness and compared to the P skewness, like, for example, Kozan and co-authors, they find that the risk neutral skewness of the market is more negative than the realized skewness of the market, which points to the idea that investors have a preference for positive skewness and they, they don't like negative uh, skewness. But then there is a paper of Chang and co-authors where they basically do the same empirical exercise of Ang and co-authors and they look at the sensitivity in the cross-section of the stocks to the market skewness. And they find that the stocks that are more sensitive to the market skewness have a lower return. So which is basically the same as variance. So this points to a negative skewness risk premium as if investors don't like uh, uh, positive skewness. So then why this is the case? Well, it can be for many reasons, but uh, we know that there is a, a strong relation, uh, bet correlation between the third moment, the skewness, and the first and second moment. So it's important to be able to isolate these moments. And also there is another problem. So in the cross-section, the cross-section of stocks, uh, the skewness, the realized skewness is positive, while the realized skewness of the market is negative. So it's not, it's not obvious a priori that the preference of investors for skewness in individual stocks and in the market should be the same. So here is where my paper fits. So I study the skewness risk premium in individual stocks, but measured with the return of a trading strategy where an investor buys the skewness. So the skewness swaps, analogously of to the variant swaps. But I study skewness swaps in individual stocks. And what I find is that the uh, skewness risk premium in individual stocks measured with this methodology is positive. So investors have a preference for positive skewness, not only at the market level, but also at the individual stock level. So, and then the, the next question is, uh, um, does this premium reflect systematic or idiosyncratic risk? 
because we know that uh, the return of, of the stocks is related to the return of the market through the CAPM, through the CAPM beta relationship. So then the, the skewness of, of individual stocks is related to the skewness of the market. So then the skewness risk premium in individual stocks reflects, uh, there is a, a systematic component in that can reflect the systematic skewness risk. So then uh, when I look at the systematic and idiosyncratic component of uh, uh, the skewness risk premium, what I find is that they, there are, they are both significant and positive. So investors have a preference for positive skewness at the market level, and, but also positive skewness at the idiosyncratic level. And this idiosyncratic component increased through time, and in particular after the financial crisis. And then finally, the final question is, well, why idiosyncratic, risk, idiosyncratic skewness risk in this case is priced? Because we know that uh, in in uh, uh, in a frictionless uh, uh, asset pricing model, then idiosyncratic risk should not be priced. So then, finally, I show that there is a link between the idiosyncratic skewness risk premium and short selling frictions, in the sense that the stocks that are uh, where the short selling frictions are higher, they have a higher idiosyncratic uh, skewness risk premium. So the methodology that I use to study the skewness risk premium in the individual stocks is a trading strategy, uh, where an investor can buy directly the skewness of the asset, the skewness swap. So um, in order to better uh, to understand how the skewness swap work, uh, it's, uh, it's better to, um, to look at the more um, analyzed and studied uh, analogous variance swap. So what is a variant swap? So a variant swap is a contract where um, the uh, long side of uh, the variant swap, so basically the buyer of, of the variance at maturity, he gets the realized variance and he pays a constant which is called the variant swap rate. So the payoff of this contract is equal to the difference between the realized variance and the variant swap rate. So the realized variance is measured with the sum of the daily squared returns, while uh, uh, the variance swap rate is uh, measured uh, at the beginning of, uh, the, um, of the contract at time t with uh, the price of a portfolio of options with the maturity equal to the maturity of, uh, of the contract. So this is uh, a very standard result which has been proven in Karen Wu, in, in Martin, uh, or, or also can be proved with uh, um, with, uh, uh, with, with the result uh, of, uh, uh, of Bakshi and, and Madan. So um, because the swap has a zero net, net, net market value at entry, so then uh, this uh, variance swap rate is equal to the risk neutral expectation of the realized variance. And from this comes the result of uh, that this can be measured with a portfolio of option, with, uh, with the spanning results of, of uh, Mad uh, Bakshi and Madan, for example. So, the swap, the, the payoff of the variance swap, so the difference between the realized variance and the, the, um, the risk neutral variance, is a direct measure of the realized variance. So, this is the standard variance swap, which are traded OTC. So, then, what is a skewness swap? So, the skewness swap is defined exactly in the analogous way. So, it's a contract where the long side of the skewness swap at maturity he gets a realized skewness and he pays a skewness swap rate. So then, now, how do we measure realized skewness? So it can be tempting to define the realized skewness as the sum of cube returns, analogously as, uh, uh, to what has uh, been done for, for variance, the sum of the cube return. But if we do that, we do not have a static portfolio of options that measures uh, the risk neutral expectation of this sum of cube returns. So why is that? Well, because skewness presents more econometric challenges than variance. It's not that easy. So the um, ad hoc results of Karen Wu or Martin for variance cannot be directly extended to skewness. And there is also another problem. So the spending results or Bakshi and Madam are results that uh, uh, allow us to basically compute the risk neutral expectations of the moments from time zero to maturity, to big T. 
And for variance, because variance has the time aggregation property, then we can use these spanning results also to measure the um, expectation of the uh, variance computed with high frequency returns. What, what does it mean? Because if prices are martingales, then we have that the expectation of the sum of the squared re daily returns, this is equal to the expectation of the squared return of the, over the full period. And this is because the cross product, they vanish because prices are martingales, so the increments are independent. For skewness, we do not have this result. So the expectation of, of the change in price to the power of three, this is not equal to the expectation of the sum of the cube returns because the cross products, which are equal to the increment to the power of two times the other increment, they do not vanish. So we cannot use the spanning result of, uh, of Bakshi and Madam to compute the expectation of the sum of cube returns. So skewness is more challenging. So what do I do? Well, uh, because I want to keep uh, uh, a simple strategy, a static portfolio of options, because I don't want to, re to rebalance my portfolio of options, otherwise I have a high trading cost. And I also want to have a model-free uh, model methodology, then uh, the, the price I have to pay for this is to choose uh, um, a definition of realized skewness at the low frequency of returns. So this is the skewness I'm going to trade, is the return of the forward price to the power of three, but the forward price over the full period, okay? So in this sense, is at a low frequency, because this skewness turns out to be easily tradable with the new methodology of Schneider and Troiani. And I'm gonna show you how. So Schneider and Troiani have a new methodology in the Journal of Financial Econometrics in 2019, where basically they show how an investor can trade a generic swap strategy. So how this swap is structured. So the long side of the swap, so the buyer, receives at maturity a floating leg and pays a fixed leg. The fixed leg is settled at the start of the swap, and is given by a portfolio of out-of-the-money options, where P are the put options and C are the call option. And phi is a function which basically gives, it gives me the, the weights that the option have in the, in the portfolio. And then we have the floating leg is equal to the payoff of the option portfolio. So the floating leg is realized at maturity, is equal to the payoff of the same option portfolio plus a delta edge in the underlying uh, forward. So uh, the swap has zero market value at entry because the fixed leg is equal to the risk neutral expectation of the floating leg. So here, Phi is extremely important because basically phi, uh, I can choose phi in a different way if I wanted to trade skewness, I want to trade variance, I want to trade actually the way they, um, they set is that they, with, the, with this setting, you can trade every Bregma divergence. And variance and skewness are sp special types of these uh, divergence. So what, what is the skewness swap that I implement in this paper? So I implement the swap methodology of uh, uh, Schneider and Troiani with a special weight function. So I choose phi equal to uh, phi s. So the, um, the formula is in the paper, but it's, it's very long, such that, and I prove it, that the fixed leg is equal to the risk neutral expectation of my third moment. So the skewness I want to trade. And the error is a function of the moment to the power of five. So this result is very important because here I can isolate. So here I don't have the fourth moment and I don't have the second moment. So this is very important because actually in their paper where they uh, show examples of how to trade variance and skewness, they have the moment to the power of four. But I show when I study the convergence of this, uh, of this, uh, uh, of this proof that actually it's very important to, to make this, uh, um, to make it independent of the second and also of the fourth moment. So here, when I studied the converge, of course, so this, uh, um, this formula is uh, true for a continuum of options 
uh, for an infinite number of options which cover a, a full range of strikes from zero to infinite. So, uh, of course, empirically, I do not have that. But in my um, convergence analysis, uh, what I find is that it's not really important the number of options. Actually, I have a very good convergence with just eight or 10 options. What is very important is the moneyness range and uh, to have like a, a good approximation, so an error below um, around 1%, I need between three, between three and four standard deviations to have a, a, good, a good convergence. So then another problem that I have, but which turns out to not be a very big problem, is that uh, the options on individual stocks are American, while here in the formula, these options are European. So then uh, what, what can I do? Um, I want to keep the tradability of the, of the strategy because I want to measure a return, uh, the skewness uh, uh, risk premium that an investor can actually gain. So I don't want to, to make some, some modification and back out uh, uh, the European price from America because otherwise this would not be tradable. So what do I do? I, I uh, compute the, um, the, um, the fixed leg and the floating leg directly with American options. So here I take the American price and here I take the payoff of the option portfolio considering the early exercise. So my investor is going to optimally exercise also the American options. And, uh, uh, and in this way, basically I have an error because this convergence is for European option. But it turns out I measure this error and it turns out that it's not that big. So actually you can compute the skewness swap directly with American options without really losing much of the skewness uh, convergence. So by, do, by, by, do, by using this uh, methodology, uh, I measure the, um, the skewness risk premium with the return of the skewness swap. Because here, the re what is the return of the skewness swap? It's the floating leg minus the fixed leg. So it's the realized skewness minus the risk neutral skewness. So this is a direct measure of uh, the, the skewness risk premium. So, I apply the uh, skewness swaps uh, to each stock and uh, index in uh, uh, the time period 2003-2017. So I pa think- Paola, can I interrupt for a second? So, yes. so before you get to the data, there's a question about the methodology. Yes. So I wanted to interrupt before you get to the data. So from John Crosby, the question is, how is your methodology and the swap methodology of Schneider and Troiani different from that of Neuberger and Kojan and Neuberger and Schneider? Yes, yes, yes. So it's, uh, it's different. So, um, yeah, so, okay. Uh, Kozan and, and uh, co-authors, they do a skewness swap and they actually measure the sum of the cube returns. So, but the problem of that methodology is that uh, there are two problems. So the first one is that they have a continuous rebalancing of options. So for individual stocks, this is not good because then it basically you, you lose everything in trading costs. And the second uh, problem, well, that I, I, I preferred to avoid is that uh, the methodology is model dependent. So it's linked to a diffusion, while this methodology is completely model free. Okay. Did I answer? Okay. I'll let him, I, I think you answered it, but I'll let John ask a follow-up if he disagrees. So why don't you carry on? Okay. So um, I, I fix a monthly horizon for the skewness swaps, which start and end on the third Friday of each month. And this is consistent with the, the maturity structure of the standard uh, option data. So uh, in this way, um, every uh, stock and index is going to have a time series of non-overlapping non monthly realized skewness risk premium, which are basically the returns of every, of every, sw of every monthly uh, swaps. Um, I apply the skewness swaps to all the components of the S&P 500, so all the individual stocks, the index, and also the sector indexes uh, of which uh, uh, that uh, all together they uh, compose the S&P 500. Because I do have option on, on the indexes, on the, on the ETFs that track the index. So the time period is 2003-2017, and uh, the databases are, are standard. So 
This table shows the uh, mean and the median return of uh, uh, monthly return of a portfolio of skewness swaps on individual stocks. So basically every month I compute a skewness swap for every stock. So then I can group all these skewness swaps into portfolio value weighted. So where I weight each skewness swap with the weight that the stock has in the, in the index. So this is the average returns and also the average returns for the skewness swap on the S&P 500. So for the median, these in brackets are is the bootstrap confidence interval, and for the mean, this is the T statistic, and the last line is the annualized Sharpe ratio. So it stands out that the numbers are huge, are very, are very high. They are actually for the S and P 500, they are actually comparable to what has been done for variance. So uh, Karen Wu find that the average monthly return of a variance swap is minus 60% for the S&P 500. So it's, uh, this is higher, but okay, so we are doing skewness. So the numbers are huge. They are higher for the index than for individual stocks, but also for individual stocks, we really have very, very high numbers. We can also see that uh, uh, the median is higher than the mean. This is also true for the S&P 500, and this makes, uh, uh, makes sense. This is, this is uh, uh, because of how, how these returns are, are, are structured, because we have that these skewness swaps, they make money uh, pretty much always, and the, but when the skewness drop, then you really have a big, a big crash. So, it's easier to see it in this, uh, in this picture where basically here I show the uh, cumulative return of investing $1 at the beginning of my sample period in the first, uh, in the basket of, of skewness swaps in individual stocks the first month. And then I reinvest the proceeds in the next, for the next month, for the next basket of skewness swaps. So this is the cumulative return. So, it really looks like the return of selling an insurance. So you, you make money, you basically almost always make money until the trigger event happens. In this case, a drop in the skewness, in which case you lose a lot of money. And, it, and here you can really lose, you can lose everything, you can lose more than everything because uh, uh, you have also short position in, in the option portfolios. So, um, this is why the mean, of course, the, these crashes are really uh, making the mean very low, while the median is, is, is much higher. So we can interpret the, uh, so the mean is the mean of everything, but the median is basically the average return uh, outside crashes. And, uh, um, is, and because, it's, uh, because of, of the structure of these uh, returns, uh, this is why I'm going to use in the next uh, analysis robust uh, econometrics. So I also, yeah. So, so there are two questions that I think are related to the previous slide. So, so let me ask, jump in and ask them here, right? So now the, the slide with the picture. I'm not sure they are, but anyway, from Torben Anderson, intuitively, why are the risk neutral skewness not sensitive to the large negative returns or deep OTM put options? And then I think a related question uh, from Steve Figluski, what is the denominator for the returns calculation? If it is the value of the swap portfolio of the outset, can you get returns worse than negative 100%? Oh. Uh, and a related question for Mike Chernoff, right? How does lose more than everything, what does lose more than everything mean in practice? Aren't you kicked out of your position? Uh, so I think you have to put money on the, on the, on the account. So when you have a, a short position and you lose, you lose, uh, so you have, you, you have to put in the account uh, some money and then you can lose more than that. Basically, you have a margin call, so then you can put more money. So um, the, the, the previous question, so, okay, so the denominator, this is, this is very, this, this is important. I actually did robustness checks because it's not, it's, not the, it's not clear. Also, when you have a short position, what is, the denomi what is your return? What do you put in the denominator? It's not so clear. So what I do here, what the, the, the numbers I'm presenting you, I put at the denominator, the, uh, all the uh, fixed leg, 
So basically the, the price of the skewness, but all in absolute value. So also the short position, I don't consider uh, as minus, but I consider as plus. As the, I don't consider that you receive money, but I'm considering as if you pay money. So to make it, you know, like uh, uh, all of that. Then I also did as a robustness check, I considered the, the fact that when you have a short position in options, you have to put not only the price of the option in the margin account, but you also have to put 20% more or, or some, or it, it depends on the moneyness, even 40% more. So I also did that. And I mean, what, what it changed is that the numbers are a little bit lower, but not much. So this is, uh, um, this is what I did. Okay. Um... So I'm not sure this answered Torben's question, but so so is this picture, I guess I'll just repeat what his question was. Intuitively, why are the risk neutral skewness not sensitive to the large negative returns or deep OTM put options? Uh, they, they are. So, okay. the, so here, so I think I'm not getting that that well the question. So uh, the negative returns of what? So um, so maybe maybe uh, maybe it makes sense if he still wants to ask it. Maybe it makes sense for you and him to talk about it at the end. And yeah. then one clarifying question yeah. from Bjorn Urocker. Um This is back in the theory part. Are you referring to the Trohani and Schneider 2018 paper in the Journal of Financial Econometrics? When you and John Crosby were talking about Trohani and Schneider, is that the paper you were talking about? So, uh, the, the, so uh, I think it's 2009. So anyway, the, the, the title of the paper is uh, the divergence swap. So the price of divergence. Uh, so okay. um, I think it's one. I, I, I so um, maybe I, I mistake. I, I, I put the wrong uh, year, but it's it's uh, the methodological paper where they define uh, the divergence swaps, uh, the Bragman divergence swaps. So um, yeah. So I'm sorry if I put the wrong year, but um, I don't know. All right, we'll let you move on. Okay. Um, Okay, so then um, I compute the analysis for the individual uh, skewness risk premium. So I compute, uh, because before the previous uh, table, uh, I had a portfolio of individual swaps. While here, I, I consider the individual uh, time, se the time series of individual uh, swap returns. So the median is still very high and it's significant for almost the, the, uh, all, the, all the stocks. So in total, the stocks that I consider are around 700 because they are the stocks that have been part of the S&P 500, at least in a sub period during my, my sample period. So then I also compute two robustness checks. So the first one, I compute uh, the return of the skewness swap considering European options. So what I do is uh, what basically the literature usually do. So I take the uh, American option and from that I back out the European option. So this swap is not tradable, but it tells me what is uh, uh, the, the, um, the return of the European swap and it's basically the same. So, uh, so I, we don't have to worry about uh, uh, Euro, uh, early exercise premium. And then this is most important. So then uh, how, what is the role of the transaction cost? Because uh, uh, we are trading options and also in the Delta edge, the underlying. So I consider the transaction cost both in the option market and in the, uh, in the underlying market. And what I, what, we find, what I find is that the return basically half, but it's still positive and significant for the majority of the stocks. And by looking separately at the Q skewness and the P skewness, what, uh, uh, what I find is that the Q-skewness, the risk neutral skewness is very negative, uh, while the realized skewness is, is positive. So all in all, so what does it mean that this return is positive? So this return is positive at the market level and at the individual stock level. And this is, can be interpreted uh, as a, a support to the hypothesis that investors have a preference for positive skewness and they don't like negative skewness. Why? Because these skewness swaps are, are uh, trading strategies that lose money when the skewness drops. And, in that, and the fact that the return is positive is uh, um, basically tell us that investors want to be compensated for this risk because they don't like a drop in skewness. So this is the, the economic, uh, um, the economic takeaway from, from this result. 
I also do um, an analogous exercise to what have been done for correlation. So by comparing the, um, the skewness swap of the index with the basket of skewness swaps, then I can back out the cost skewness risk premium in the same way in which uh, the literature has backed out the correlation risk premium from the difference between the variance of the index and the basket of, of variances. So this is simply a mathematical identity. And I can do this uh, exercise for, for, all my, uh, for all my sectors uh, because I have option on all the, on all the sectors. And uh, the return of this trading strategy long the index and short uh, the basket gives me uh, like a, a direct measure of the cost skewness risk premium. So what I find is that the cost skewness risk premium so calculated is, is very high and positive and significant for all the sectors. So this tells me that investors like uh, uh, positive cost skewness and they don't like uh, negative uh, cost skewness. So the next, so, so far we have seen that the return of my trading strategy is positive, not only at the market level that has had already been, been done with the different ways that we knew that, but also the individual stock level. So then it makes sense to ask whether these skewness risk premium in individual stocks reflect a systematic or idiosyncratic risk. So let's assume that uh, there is uh, the, the, the stocks follow an, a single index type generating uh, generation process so that the return of the stocks are linearly related to the return of the market through this linear beta relationship in the P measure and in the Q measure and that these uh, errors are independent. So from this assumption, then mechanically, mechani mathematically, the uh, skewness risk premium in individual stocks uh, is related to the skewness risk premium of the market. So this is uh, the, the P uh, expectation of the return to the power of three minus the Q expectation of the return to the power of three. So this is the payoff of my skewness swap. And this is the payoff of the uh, market skewness swap. So then the question is, uh, um, I find a positive individual skewness risk premium. Does this, does this premium reflect uh, this systematic part, so B, this, this uh, parenthesis, or there is also an idiosyncratic component, and if there is, with which sign? So to test for this, I regress for each stock the time series of the swap payoff to the time series of the swap payoff of the market. And what I find is that for not for all of the stock, but for many stocks, for the majority of the stocks, there is an idiosyncratic component, which is positive. Uh, so when there is, uh, is positive. And also for, for many stocks, uh, there is also a, a, a systematic uh, component. So, and in addition to that, if I break down my sample period into, two sub, into three subsamples, the before crisis period, during crisis, and after the crisis, what I find is that there is a, a huge increase in my risk premium from before the crisis to after the crisis, and in particular in individual stocks, and also in the idiosyncratic risk premium. So the first line show the, uh, the increase of the portfolio of skewness swaps in individual stocks, which basically doubles. The skewness swap on the index increase, but not that much. If I take, if I look individually, then I also have a huge increase, not only in, in magnitude, but also in, in significance. And, and this cannot be explained with transaction costs. It's not that the transaction costs went up, actually they went down. And, and if I consider transaction costs, actually um, the premium becomes five times more. And uh, by looking at the change of the, of the Q skewness and the P skewness, um, I find that there is a, a huge decrease in the Q skewness of the, in the risk neutral skewness, which becomes more negative. And by looking at the idiosyncratic part of the skewness risk premium, which is basically the residual of the previous regression, what I find is that there is an increase, not only uh, in, in magnitude, but also in, in significance. So I also break down the results by sector in order to see if there, is, uh, uh, if there are some, uh, um, some special uh, if there are some special sectors that are driving the results. And uh, I mean, actually there are, but the, it's pretty homogeneous. So here I'm going to consider the, um, uh, the return of the portfolio of individual swaps, and I'm going to compare with the cost skewness risk premium, which is basically a measure of the, of the market credit. 
crash risk, crash risk. But I'm going to do at the, at the sector levels. So I look at the numbers for all the sectors. And what I find is that there is an increase for all of them. But then when I look at the statistical significance, so this is a difficult task because these skewness swaps are bet on crashes. So I showed you the picture. So they, there is a lot of, when there is a crash, then you have really huge outliers. So it's difficult econometrically to handle the time series of these, of these returns. So what do, how, how can I assess the statistical significance of this increase? So what I do is the following, I compute to the bootstrap confidence interval of uh, the, the median return in the pre-crisis period and the bootstrap confidence interval of uh, the returns in the post-crisis period. And then I check for the minimum alpha such that these two, these two um, confidence intervals do not overlap. And for me, this is, the, this is the, um, the level at which I can say that there is a statistical significant increase. So with the star, I put the, uh, the second for which the alpha is uh, less than 10%. So basically I have an increase for all the sectors except utility, energy, and materials. So this is very interesting because um, this is consistent with other papers on variance risk premium where they find that uh, these, these uh, uh, sectors, they have a very high idiosyncratic variance risk also from since the beginning of the sample, which is basically what I find here. So the, the, the portfolio of individual swap return was high uh, also before. But the point is that for all the other sectors, I, I have a, a statistical significant increase. Also for some of the cost skewness swap returns, but less than for individual stocks. Okay, so of course there are there is a number of open question of uh, what is uh, uh, that uh, that uh, that opens for the robustness check. So the first point is how much uh, uh, of my results depend on the methodology that I'm using. So I'm using these skewness swaps that are are basically they, they come from the divergent swaps of Schneider and Troiani. So then the question is maybe you are getting these results because of this methodology. So um, I, I computed the risk neutral skewness also with the, the Bakshi, um, the usual Bakshi, method, uh, Bakshi and Kapadia methodology, and I do find the same results. So I, I find that the skewness for individual stocks um, decreased uh, more than for the market after the financial crisis. Um, here, I'm also, uh, I'm also, um, I also did uh, like a completely model-free, um, model-free exercise, uh, which, uh, uh, which is this picture that I like a lot. Because here, I'm not doing any skewness. Here, here I'm simply plotting the implied volatility smile for individual stocks, the black line, and for the market before and after the financial crisis. And basically, we can visually see that the, the skewness, so the uh, the, the options in the moneyness category one are the out of the money put option. So here we can visually see that the skewness for individual stocks become more negative, the risk neutral one becomes more negative after the financial crisis than for the market. And this is due because the out of the money put options become more expensive. And of course, this drives my results. So this is like my, my risk neutral um, skewness, my fixed leg becomes more negative. So it seems that investors are concerned about crashes in individual stocks, uh, but in a way that is not fully explained by the market uh, skewness risk uh, because it's, it's, it's different. And also this is reflected by my idiosyncratic skewness risk premium that is there and becomes even, even higher. So then the, the second big question is uh, what is the role of the option liquidity and availability in this context, because of course the, the market for individual stock options is different than the market for uh, for for S and P 500 options is is less liquid and the liquidity increased through time, and this is clearly playing a role. So here I also have a, a very nice picture uh, where I show the cross-sectional time series of traded moneyness. So what do I do? So I have uh, uh, the moneyness is basically um, measured in standard deviation. So the negative one are the out of the money put option here, and the positive ones are the out of the money call options. So for each point in time, I compute uh, for each stock the uh, moneyness, uh, the most uh, uh, out of the money, the moneyness of the most out of the money put option traded. 
and the moneyness of the most out of the money call option traded for, for each stock. So then I have a cross section. And then I'm going plotting the 10% quantile, 50% and 90%. So it's clear from this picture that after the financial crisis, investors are trading more out of the money put option. More, also more out of the money call option, but less. So the, the, the trading is really moving towards, uh, so the, the range is really um, expanding and also going more towards uh, the, uh, the left skewness. And this, this, and this is reflected, uh, this is reflected here for, with, the, with the higher price of out of the money put option. So investors are concerned about individual crashes. And this is all part of the story. But, but there are two things. So one thing is the mechanicality of this with my uh, results. So of course, in my skewness swap, if I have more put option, if I have a, a, a bigger range for put options and a smaller range for, for call option and less options, then I mechanically have a more negative skewness. So this is something that I don't want. But the other thing is that because I have more trading here, then this pushes the prices higher and I have a more negative skewness. And this is, and this is, what, this is what I want to, to catch. It's not the mechanicality. So in order to take away this mechanicality, I compute what I call a model-based skewness swap. So instead of taking uh, the actual prices of options in order to compute the fixed leg, et cetera, I fit a model at every point in time, every month, at the, the, start of the, uh, the, the start of the swap, I fit a model. I fit a Merton jump diffusion model, and then I compute my uh, fixed leg of the swap with the prices that are taken from the model. With, with the model, I can compute all the price I want, all the moneyness range that I want. So I, I, I take a very large moneyness range, minus four standard deviation plus four standard deviation, and I take 40 prices, 20 calls and 20 puts. And I do this for the market, for individual stocks, and in all sample periods. So I have the same number of options in all months and the same moneyness range. So I take away the mechanicality. And what I find is results that are very comparable to what I found with my tradable skewness swap. So uh, the, the return for the market is higher. Uh, the, skewness, uh, uh, the skewness risk premium is higher. And it increases, but it increases less than for individual stocks. So for individual stocks, we have a huge increase in magnitude and significance. So finally, um, how much time I have? Um, uh, 10 more minutes. Okay, good, good. So after showing that uh, um, the skewness risk premium in, uh, in individual stocks and in the market is, uh, is positive and that part of it is uh, idiosyncratic, so the, the final question, and the, it's idiosyncratic, it's positive, and it even increased through time. So um, the final question is uh, uh, why? Why we have this idiosyncratic uh, skewness risk? So um, of course there are uh, probably many reasons, but here I'm going to focus on, on one in particular, uh, and uh, it's a short selling cost. So when you want to short sell a stock, then you, um, you cannot do it freely because there are many costs. There are like, uh, Money cost, so dollar cost, because you have you. So first of all, you have to find someone that uh, uh, lend you a stock, and you have to pay a, a lending fee. So, in order to proxy for short selling frictions, uh, I use the ratio of the short interest on ETF ownership. Well, uh, the short interest is defined as the the percentage of shares that are held uh, short. And uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this, this is standard. This is, has already been used in the, in the literature, and this proxies for the demand for, for short selling. Because we are, basically we assume that all the investors that want to short, they do it. So then it's the, um, this is basically the shorting in place. And then ETF ownership is defined as the percentage of shares that are held by ETFs. I take these uh, numbers from the uh, S12 uh, file of Thomson Reuters, Bloomberg, and ETF.com. And this proxies for the supply of shares to borrow. Because uh, uh, ETFs are known to be uh, lenders of, this, of the shares they, uh, they own. So this is a like um, 
this is also the, a way they, they, they make money and they keep the fee very, very low. So by using the, um, the ratio of the demand for shorting over the supply for shorting, this proxies for, for, for the short selling frictions, because the higher the ratio is basically when the demand is high and, and, the, uh, and the supply is, uh, is low. So first, I'm going to uh, analyze the, uh, the relation between short selling friction and the option market. So what has been already done in the, in the literature here and there is that uh, we know that there is a connection between the put option volumes and short selling friction, in particular during the financial crisis. So here I find back the result. So uh, by computing a univariate portfolio sort, so I sort my stocks according to my, uh, to my proxy for short selling friction. And what I find is that for the stocks that are more uh, short sale constrained, then I have a higher volume input options than call option. But then this is and this is new. I also find that there is a, the, the the option market is more developed and liquid for these short sale constrained stocks. Because if I look at the option volume as a, as a percentage of the uh, stock volume, then I also find that uh, um, the option volume is higher for the stocks that are more short sale constrained. So also with a, a very high statistical significance, and, but also the number of options. So the number of options that are there is higher. So uh, there is really, uh, so investors are really, um, you know, moving from, from shorting uh, in, the, in the stock market to the option market and the, the option market reacts to that. So the volumes are higher, the number of options are higher, so the market is more, is more developed. And this clearly has an influence also on my skewness risk premium. So here I investigate the relation between the short selling frictions and the idiosyncratic uh, skewness risk premium with a double portfolio sort on the two, um, on the two measures. So on the um, supply measure of friction and the demand measure of friction. So I can also see the relation between the two. And what I find is that uh, for, for the stocks uh, where uh, the, the two measure of frictions are binding, so the ETF ownership is low and the, the short interest is high, then I have the highest idiosyncratic skewness risk premium. And here I also find that the, um, you can really see that when, when one friction is binding, so for example, the short interest is high, then here you can better see uh, the cross-sectional, uh, uh, so the, the heterogeneity due to the different ETF ownership. And also when the ETF ownership is low, then you can see better like the significance of the, uh, of the short interest, the effect of the short interest on the idiosyncratic skewness risk premium. So this is formally uh, also um, tested into a fama Macbeth regression of the idiosyncratic skewness risk premium on my short selling friction measure and also other controls for liquidity, uh, variance risk premium, or also uh, firm characteristics. And uh, the results are very, are very stable. So the stocks that are more short sale constraints, they have a higher idiosyncratic uh, skewness risk premium. And finally, I also use a, a, as a case study the, um, the, the complete short sale ban that happened during the financial crisis. Because uh, during the 18th of September 2008 to the 8th of October 2008, there was a complete short sale ban only for financial stocks. So complete in the sense that it was, it was impossible. It was impossible to, to short cover and cover, the, so it was impossible. So um, then I have, uh, so the third Friday of September 2008, it was around 20, 22 of, uh, of September. So then uh, the at the start date of my <clears throat> student swap, the ban was in place. So investors couldn't short. So what I do is that I take the return of my strategy only in that month, and I regress on, uh, on a financial dummy, which is one only for financial stocks and zero for others, because they want to see if the risk premium is higher only for the stocks for which there was the ban. And this is what I find. So here I find that the financial dummy carries a positive uh, coefficient also after controlling for the variance risk premium. And then what I do is that, uh, um, but, but of course there, is, there might be the correlation with some also, um, I mean, the, the short sale ban was put because uh, uh, clearly the banks were in trouble. So, so there is clearly, there might be a correlation with, uh, with, uh, something, uh, with something else. But then it's interesting that the month after, 
from October to November, uh, where, where the banks were, were, were still in troubles, but, um, if I, but the, 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 the short sale ban was, was relieved, then if I computed the same regression with the financial damage, then I don't find the significance. So clearly this uh, doesn't prove any causality, but it shows evidence that there is a connection. There is a connection between short selling frictions and uh, idiosyncratic uh, skewness uh, risk premium. So the two markets are, are connected. So in the literature, it's already here and there, and here I'm completing with my, with my methodology. So, and with this, I, I conclude. So um, in this paper, I investigated the skewness risk and the skewness risk premium in individual stocks by using a, a trading strategy, skewness swaps, which are a trading strategy with which an investor can buy the skewness. And uh, in the same way in which uh, the variance swaps have been used to study the variance risk premium, I, I use the skewness swaps to study the skewness risk premium. And uh, I also, uh, so the results support, uh, strongly support the hypothesis that the skewness risk premium is positive. So investors like uh, skewne, positive skewness and they, they don't like negative skewness and they want to be compensated for that. And this is consistent with the theory of, of Krauss and, and Litzenberg. And then when I decompose the skewness risk premium in the systematic and idiosyncratic part, I find that there is an important idiosyncratic part that even increased through time. And then finally, I show that the idiosyncratic part of the skewness risk premium is connected with short selling friction. Thank you. All right, Paula, thank you. Uh, so at this stage, um, I will ask some questions that are in the chat and haven't been answered yet, but uh, at this stage, everyone should feel free to unmute themselves and ask their questions with the microphone if they want to. But anyway, some things from the chat. Um, so there was some clarification about what Schneider and Troyani paper you were talking about, but uh, Francois Kokoma found the paper and put it in the chat. So I think I think that was resolved by the discussion in the chat. Um, and then it's clear I misunderstood Torben's question earlier, and there was some discussion in the chat to clarify it. So I asked, I misunderstood Torben's question earlier, and I asked it at the wrong place. So anyway, so I'll re-ask it. So his question is, will fat tails not show up in the deep OT money put prices and be important for the pricing so don't you need to extend the risk neutral tails for good measurement? Oh, okay. So uh, if I understood correctly, the question is that uh, um, I have, I, I'm cutting the tails uh, because my options, uh, they don't go to infinite. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that, yes, this is, this is true. So this is, this is, I was really, really concerned about that for, for, for a long time. And now I'm not anymore because I'm like, the skewness I am measuring is the skewness that is there. So I am measuring the skewness that investors care. So I, I don't believe that there is a, a, a perfect behind model behind the data. So the data is there and we have to read the data. So, this, so the, my answer is the skewness I'm measuring, I'm not, I, I don't want to measure a perfect skewness that is of a model that is behind the data and that we don't know. So I am measuring the skewness that the data is, is showing me, which is the skewness that investors care. If investor wants to trade options, they can, and we, we, investors don't care. So yeah, so this is a different, uh, so this, this, yeah, this is what I do. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Peter Carr. I just want to add to what you're saying. I mean, you did um, fit the Merton jump diffusion model as a way to get, you know, admittedly model created deep, deep, deep out of the money for prices that they were concerned were lacking. And so you're addressing the issue through the use of that Merton jump diffusion model. Yeah, true, true. So, so this is Torben, uh, just to clarify. Yeah, so the, the question originally was inspired by you saying you only needed, uh, you had a limited grid and you only needed about a spread of four sigmas or something. Uh, let me rephrase the question a little bit. Um, so first of all, you're probably using quotes on options that have a positive B 
big quote and only including those like they do in the VIX calculation at the CBOE. There, the quotes can be pretty randomly uh, included or not included depending on a quote of five cents versus not. So, you know, I work quite a bit with Oleg Bondarenko in terms of figuring out what the biases that might arise. Now, it, it's more important intraday than it is for daily measures, perhaps, but as you go to third and fourth power, these things become more and more tricky. So let me just do, and I saw Oleg put this, so let me highlight Oleg's comment from the chat. Uh, we, you know, we are a little worried that sometimes the uh, range is only to minus two sigmas. Other times it's to minus 10 sigmas. And um, I think that can often be pretty idiosyncratic reasons. Uh, so doesn't it make more sense economically to keep the range that you're using fixed across time? So you're getting the same pricing or the same amount of out of the money options. Here you are potentially letting sometimes go to minus 10 sigmas and other times minus two sigmas, depending on what is quoted in the market as having positive bid prices. And I think that gets yeah. it done. Anyway, that was long. So let me just stop now and listen. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's totally, totally, totally true and agreed. And uh, um, so I, I have this uh, robustness check, the model based. So I fit the model and then I compute the options, uh, the same grid, same number of options uh, through all the periods. So I, I keep it as a robustness check and I don't put as the main uh, methodology because I, I, I like the tradability. I like the fact that what I'm showing is something that investors uh, can can trade. So. Um, yeah, but on, but I also have that. So and that uh, and, and with that, I think that by by fitting a model and then uh, and then uh, you know keeping the same range and the same number of options, then I have I can take away good part of this mechanicality. So yeah, yeah, we we you know with uh, with Bondarenko, we with all like we call it a corridor measure, right? So you can mm -hmm. make the corridor measure and just see make a robustness check for that. But mm -hmm. uh, let, me, let me just notice that, you know, when I gave a presentation, the point was that the tail many times can move quite differently than the volatilities. And if you only go far enough how to capture the volatility movements, you actually miss the independent component in the tail. That often is what's pricing the risk that investors really care about on holding equities. And if those tail measures are informative, I'm afraid sometimes you may or may not include them and in that, uh, you know. So I would love to see some even more robustness checks, but th that's it. Uh, otherwise, yeah, you are thinking about it and that's that. great. That. Okay. Okay, then there's a question in the chat from Oleg Bondarenko. So, uh, Paula, your payoff is non-normalized skewness. It is proportional to sigma cubed. If in the true model, the normalized skewness is constant and not priced, then your swap will still carry the risk premium because of the variance risk premium. Can you separate your skewness risk from variance risk? Yes, so, um, okay. So I, ha I don't have a mechanical relation with the variance because I take it away, but of course I cannot, uh, and there is, and there is a correlation. So I don't, I didn't show here, but I have a portfolio sort where I have the variance risk premium and the skewness risk premium, and they are related. And this is why also in my regressions and everything, I also take always consider variance risk premium, variance risk premium, because they are, they are not mechanically related, but they are related. So yes, they, 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 yes. Yeah, um, this is Peter Carr. I mean, so what you could do, with it, you know, along the lines Oleg's suggesting is like scale the size of the position in your skewness swap according to what the, um, according to a measure of the um, risk neutral mean of variance is. Okay, so according to the variance swap rate. So in other words, you know, what he's looking for is roughly speaking, third moment divided by uh, sigma cubed. Okay, so you could take the sigma, the variance swap rate quotas of all, cube it, and now make the size of your position be one over sigma cubed. 
Yeah, yeah, I did. I did. Yeah, 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 I did. Now I, I understand better because it's non-standardized. Yeah. So then it's missing yeah. the, the the square. Yeah, 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 of the the sigma to the power. Yeah, yeah. So I did that as well with the um oh, okay. with the, with divide. So it, it's not shown, but yes. So it's um, I mean the results are pretty are, are pretty similar. So different scale, but it's a uh, it's always positive and increased through time. Yes, yes, but it's yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, two technical questions from Bjorn Racker. I might have some trouble stating this, uh, reading the LaTeX notation here. But anyway, <laughs> uh, the delta hedging term in your swap formula does, the first one, the delta hedging term in your swap formula does not seem to correspond to the usual formula. Uh, the sum over I of phi prime times the change in the futures price. Uh, that's the first question. The second question is why delta hedge at all? Suppose I implement a perfect delta hedge. Wouldn't the delta hedge skewness swap then give me a zero payoff? Yes, so um, very good questions that I also got from the referees that rejected my paper. So, <laughs> uh, so okay. Uh, Okay, so the methodology uh, that I take from uh, Schneider and Troiani, and I call the terms exactly as they do. So it's true, delta hat, they call delta hedge something that is not usually delta hedge. So there is not the delta and, the, and, the, and, the, and then, uh, you know, like to, to, to make delta equal to zero. So it's not the usual sense. So here is um, basically their methodology. So what do they do with their swap is that they can trade the phi, the phi Bregman divergence, okay? So this is the realized, uh, the realized uh, di divergence, which for me is, uh, for my, with my fee is the skewness. So then what you trade is uh, the sum of the daily divergences, which is equal to this uh, divergence over the full period, which is the payoff of the option portfolio plus this term. So the delta edge. Okay, so this is where it comes from. It's true, it's not the usual, the usual delta edge, but it's just the term because you are because you are um, computing like like in the underlying. So then the second question: Why delta hedging at all? So um, to be honest, I did when I compute the returns because the delta edge as an expectation is zero, so um, it doesn't change much the formulas. But of course, it comes from this uh, from this uh, phi Bregman divergence. So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't trade it. The, the, the right the fig Bergman divergence if I take it away. But empirically, to be honest, when I compute without the delta edge, the, the results almost, they, they, they really don't change much. So it's not, uh, it's not that, that important. So let me ask a, a question. Your universe is all stocks and option metrics, that is all optionable stocks, or is it all optionable stocks that satisfy certain criteria? No, so I, I take only stocks that are part of the S&P 500. Okay. Yes, so that have been part of the S&P 500 in my period. I, I consider around 700 stocks. And I don't, I don't uh, compute the swap if I have less, so I, I, I require to have two, minimum two traded calls and two traded puts to compute the, uh, the, the swap. So otherwise uh, I, I don't take into account. So not um, many are okay. going to be hard to borrow, but what do you do about stocks that are hard to borrow? How do you compute the forward price? So in the fixed le to compute your fixed leg, you need to compute the forward price. Yeah. How do you compute the forward price for stocks that are hard to borrow? Yes, so this is this is a, this is a good point. So uh, for stocks that are hard to borrow, there must be a fee. So the problem is that this lending fee is not a really cross-sectional different uh, uh, in my sample because when I looked at a, a small sample of this, I don't have the full data set, but I have a, I, I, I had a small sample, and it's basically the same for all stocks in my in my for the S&P 500. This lending fee. So then basically what happens is that simply the uh, return is, is is a little bit low. It's basically a new another transaction cost. But it's not that I get cross-sectional heterogeneity that much. Um, this is Peter Carr, I just had a quick question. So what's the phi in this page that we're at that you're gonna end up using? So the formula. Uh, 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 
I don't have in the slides. Uh... It, I thought maybe it was the cube of the rate of no, the no, log of the ratio. Very, uh, Is that wrong? Okay. It's in the appendix because it's very. Just if I. Here. So I don't know if you can see. Is it the top equation 21? Yes. Can you see it? Yeah, I can. Okay. So, uh, okay, so this, yeah, so, okay, so, so the way I did, yeah, so the way I did this, so how, how, how did I come up with this? So uh, the way I did is that I take, uh, um, so they, they make examples, Schneider and Troyani, in their paper of the of divergence, uh, of, of, of the how to trade the third moment and how to trade the fourth. And I take a combination of these two in okay. order, you know, to make independence of the fourth moment. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much, Paola. It, uh, it was a very interesting presentation and it uh, clearly uh, led to a very interesting discussion. We thank you very much for uh, this and uh, uh, we hope that uh, uh, we'll see all of you next week for Patrick Augustin's presentation, uh, the first of the Early Career Researchers uh, series in August. On that note, uh, we're stopping the recording now. If you want to have some FaceTime with uh, Paola, you're welcome to stay. Otherwise, I wish you a great remainder of your week. Ciao.